Good morning. You are a lively bunch this morning. It was a hard time getting everybody to stop talking and, 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 and coming in. But welcome to Pleasant Hill Community Church, United Church of Christ. We're delighted to have you here in worship. We're also delighted to welcome the folks who are watching us on Facebook and uh, on YouTube. We take it very seriously that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I would also like to particularly welcome today our preacher, uh, Cindy Stoller, who is a resident of Uplands, a uh, retired UCC pastor. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, her first time actually to be worshiping in person here. Uh, and so she comes uh, preaching. I'd also like to welcome Susan Stark, who is a long-term member of our church. Uh, she is also a, uh, 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 been interesting that last week Don Dowdy talked about being a Quaker, and, and Susan is one of those persons with her husband who has one foot in the UCC church and also, but participates with, with the friends. And they've had some health issues health issues keeping them from being coming to church but we're delighted to have her and her uh, piano playing and she's going to be doing some singing and feel free to sing along with her uh, as she uh, uh, as as uh, she plays now we have a special announcement from the green team Good morning. I'm Diantha Hodges, and this is Sue Peoples. Uh, Sue is the leader of the Green Team or Environmental Stewardship Team. <laughs> I'm a member. <laughs> um, so we are getting active. Fall is a time of change. To me, it's, it's a very exciting time with the leaves falling and thinking of all this carbon coming from the air down to the earth, and a time for renewal. We are called to be part of the great change of uh, from the way industrial systems as they were to change to the new world where we help regenerate the earth and peoples and societies and bring all things together. So we invite you to join us. We have a number of things coming up. Um, we have a meeting Tuesday at two o'clock. Anyone's welcome to come and just help us. We're really churning out big ideas and trying to see the way forward. I want you to... November the 2nd. And this was something we did at our last meeting. How many of you have noticed this sitting right in front of the door? Thank you. It's an invitation for you to participate, to write a comment. In our meeting, we talked about what things are we afraid of, what fears are brought up in our hearts with environmental change. You can write something. What are our appreciations? What are our thanksgivings that we give to God and the earth? And then what are ways we are seeing transformation? There's transformation happening everywhere. Where are those happening that give us hope? So please, we invite you to participate in this. November 4th, on, um, <clears throat> uh, it's a Thursday at 10 o'clock in, in the uh, building here. We'll be ha watching uh, something on the computer. It's a Pachamama Alliance 25th. Uh, global um, summit with many key people like J Jane Goodall and Paul Hawken and others speaking, a time of inspiration and hope. You're very welcome to come join us at that. But please watch your emails and little displays and things around and please participate with us as we begin to turn our lives over to God and to understanding and acting on behalf of the earth. Thank you. Even though we don't have an interim pastor right now, this church is alive and well, and a lot's going on. And now let us be invited to be prepared for worship as you listen to the prelude.
God has set this day before us. God has set our lives before us. God has set a seal upon our hearts. Holy God. We have gathered here today, trusting in your abiding love. Each of us brings something to worship. We bring the burdens of the weak. We bring prayers of hope and prayers of anguish. We bring our voices and our offerings and our questions. We bring our faith, tattered or whole as it may be. We bring our failings and our hope for forgiveness. We have gathered here because we are your people, ready to hear your word and begin again to follow in the way of our teacher, your beloved son, Jesus. Renew us, refresh us, and make us whole. Amen. From Jeremiah 31, 7 through 9. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them forth from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among great company, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. And from Mark 10, 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, 
he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Bartimaeus, a man who had not been blind from birth, had been reduced to begging. He had put himself in a good spot since travelers would have to pass by him on the road in Jericho. Like many blind people, his sense of hearing was sharp, so he must have heard people talking about Jesus and his disciples coming his way. So he started hollering, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many tried to keep him quiet, but he wouldn't stop yelling. We aren't told why people wanted to hush him. Maybe they thought Jesus would be in a hurry to move on, or maybe blind beggars weren't supposed to draw attention to themselves. They were supposed to sit with their cup or basket stretched out, maybe murmuring a little thanks if they heard a coin drop into their cup, or maybe no one else thought it would be of any use to draw Jesus' attention. Bartimaeus had been blind for a long time. Maybe he was beyond help. But Bartimaeus wouldn't give up. He was hoping against hope. It seemed only Bartimaeus had any faith that Jesus could heal him. The crowd and even the disciples seemed to have a blind spot about Jesus because they didn't expect Jesus to stop for a boisterously loud beggar. But Jesus did what he had done so many times before. He stopped and asked, what can I do for you? Jesus never thought he was too important to listen to desperate cries for help. And Bartimaeus had called him by the highest honorific title, Son of David. That was the first time in Mark's Gospel that Jesus had been called Son of David, the title ascribed to a Messiah. So Bartimaeus, the blind man, saw Jesus in a way that others could not see him, and his inner seeing, his faith, restored his eyes. That title, Son of David, was a name that would threaten the Roman occupiers and the high priests in Jerusalem. King David was a mighty military leader who 1,000 years before had defeated all the occupying enemies of Israel and united both the North and the South to be one strong nation. Many people, and perhaps Bartimaeus too, hoped Jesus would be like David, that he would assemble an army, defeat the Romans, and restore Israel to its former strength. But that was not Jesus' mission, as Bartimaeus soon learned. The Gospel tells us that after his eyesight was restored, Bartimaeus followed Jesus on his way. 
But Bartimaeus wouldn't have longed to follow Jesus on earth because Jesus and his disciples were headed out of Jericho toward Jerusalem for the final week of Jesus' life. Bartimaeus would see that the power of this son of David was the power of love, the power of healing, the power of forgiveness, the power of the spirit, not a military power like King David's. And that power of the spirit is still with us. In my years of studying scripture, it has been rare for me to read commentaries that identify Jesus as a mystic. But I'm thinking Jesus had to have been a mystic because he was in such close communion with God and with the Holy Spirit. I'm wondering if, in this morning's story, Jesus just witnessed the Holy Spirit healing Bartimaeus. Sometimes Jesus healed by touching people, as in healing another blind man in Mark's chapter 8. In that story, Jesus had to touch the blind man's eyes twice, because the first time, the blind man couldn't see clearly. He saw people looking like trees. But in this story, Jesus simply witnessed a miracle of the Spirit, saying, your faith has made you whole. And those of us with faith know the Holy Spirit is still around healing wounds, calling us to serve, and giving us visions of the future. I know the Holy Spirit is still calling people to serve here at Pleasant Hill Church, in my experience of leading worship at various churches, I've never had so many people come to ask me what I have in mind for Sunday. First, Mark Canfield asked me about the scriptures and sermon titles for the worship team in the bulletin. Then Jan Rose Murgy asked me for a photo for the newspaper notices. Then came Barbara Everett asking me what I had in mind so she could arrange the altar. Good job. I'm assuming that basket is like the beggar's basket. Great job. <laughs> then there were the musicians choosing whom, and Susan started calling me to ask about what she should choose for appropriate music, and then somebody put my name and the sermon title up on the sign. I don't know who that was. <laughs> oh, that was you? Oh, good job, you. Um, I'm gonna take a photo of that and send it to my kids. <laughs> I've never been on a billboard before. Um, and then there's Don and Dick back there doing the sound, and there are so many people. You are a whole village. I mean, in the choir, too. I don't want to leave anybody out. You're a whole village doing Sunday worship. My eyes are now open to see the strength of this church. You've weathered some stormy transitions, and you're still searching for leadership Many of you might be hoping against hope that you would find somebody soon. But in the meantime, I have faith, and I know I'm not alone, that you will keep on going strong because of the dedication of so many members so willing to serve. The Spirit can open our eyes to see what we might not have been able to see before. And I know many of you have heard or read Barbara Brown Taylor, an Episcopal priest and writer. The book study group here recently read her book, Holy Envy. Among Taylor's other books is Learning to Walk in the Dark. In that book, she challenges our notions about, about light and darkness. She asks, doesn't God work in the dark as well as in the light? Clearly, Bartimaeus had been able to see Jesus in his darkness. Taylor wrote about another blind man, a French resistance fighter named Jacques Luceron. I went to Google to figure out how to pronounce that, Jacques Luceron. And Jacques needed glasses when he was a very young boy, but he lost all of his sight because he got into a scuffle with some of his schoolmates. He fell hard against the teacher's desk, and one arm of his eyeglasses gouged one eye, and the other arm gouged the other one. So he became permanently and totally blind. 
but his parents never treated him as disabled, though they were advised to send him to a special school for the blind, they kept him in public school. They wanted him to learn how to function in a seeing world. Shortly after his accident, his father wisely said to him, always tell us when you discover something. His mother learned braille with him. They found a big desk for him at school so that he could put his braille big braille typewriter on it. And like many people, he developed heightened senses of hearing and touch. When he was 17, he was living in Nazi-occupied France. And he became alarmed about the ways Nazis were mistreating people and gaining strength in Europe. He believed not only his country of France was threatened, was threatened, but the whole of humanity. So he gathered a few of his friends and started whispering about ways they could resist the Nazis. They, at their first um, secret meeting, 52 teenage boys showed up. They never met in that large a group before, they set up their own printing press in a padded room in a nearby mental hospital. The hospital rarely needed all their padded rooms, and the Nazis never suspected resistance news could be printed there. The boys were ideally suited for running messages and for distributing newspapers. They could fool around and act like typical teenagers so the Nazi guards would never suspect them. And because they were strong and fast on their feet, they could run into fields to rescue airmen whose planes had been shot down. For several years, they did courageous work, but eventually a Nazi spy infiltrated their group. Luciran and his friends were arrested and sent to Buchenwald along with 2,000 other resistance fighters. He was one of only 30 to survive the prison. Several years after his release, he emigrated to the United States and taught French literature at the University of Hawaii. There he wrote his autobiography, And There Was Light about surviving and even thriving with blindness. His writing inspired the popular novel, which I know many of you read, um, All the Light You Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. So I spent a whole day last week engrossed in reading Lucerne's autobiography. I found it at first enchanting and then heart-wrenching. The first chapters told about the happiness of his childhood about his friends at school who would run with him. He still loved to run, but he couldn't run alone without danger of tripping or knocking into some obstacle. One schoolmate who was tall and broad-shouldered was eager to run with him. Jacques would run behind him, holding on to the back of his shirt collar so the taller boy would be his shield. But then there were the later chapters about the Nazi prison at Buchenwald. Though Jacques had every reason to become bitter about the world and all its cruelty, he never lost his love of living. He began his book with these words. When you said to me, tell me the story of your life, I was not eager to begin. But when you added, what I care most about is learning your reasons for loving life. Then I became eager, for that was a real subject. He wrote about the light which he had loved as a boy before he lost his eyesight. After he became blind, he found the light was still there, but on the inside. The light within him could change if he became fearful or angry the light inside would dim and sometimes even disappear. He learned to control his emotions, 
to go more deeply inside into his heart to search for that lost light which he loved so much. The best way to keep his inner light, he wrote, was to love. And it was his love of his parents, his boyhood friends, his country, his fellow resistance fighters that sustained him through the worst torturous times. In Buchenwald, when he was angry, and who wouldn't be angry in such a place, the light within him could go dark. When he was angry, he found himself clumsy and more prone to bump into things. So even in the Nazi prison, he would look more deeply inside himself to find the light, soothe his anger, and keep loving life. In Buchenwald, he found his mission, his way of serving others. He would remain calm and cheerful because he saw that anxiety and fear would spread quickly through the cell blocks and that panic would often lead to violent fights among the prisoners. If they were to have any chance of retaining their humanity in such an inhumane place, they needed to stay calm and positive. So Jacques would go from cell block to cell block, reporting news that he had heard on the German radio because he had learned to speak German. And he always made sure to speak with good humor and optimism. His cheer would also spread quickly through the prison. So I'll close by saying how Lucerne's book inspired me. First, I pay more attention to the sounds outside. Jacques experienced so much joy from his hearing. So I found some of that joy too. In the morning, the birds on Jan's side seemed to converse with one another. One would be chirping on this side of the road and another one on the other side of the road would seem to answer him. Of course, I have no idea what they're saying but I've become more interested in birds. I may buy some binoculars and become one of those bird watchers. Second, when I'm annoyed with some foolish driver on the road or some other such thing, I try to go more deeply inside myself and find some light. Thinking about some joyful time or a special friend helps me let go of the anger and be cheerful. I do love life too, but I don't always remember that. And third, and possibly most important, one of the reasons Jacques Lucerne was able to survive the horrors of Buchenwald was because he found a purpose to care for his fellow prisoners. I can think about having a similar purpose here, to care and to bring cheer and love of life to the people around me. In this pandemic, we all need to be cautious with one another. We wear masks, we keep our distance, we avoid large gatherings, you all know the drill. And the limitations on our normal activities can be frustrating and sometimes even depressing. But we don't have to be miserable. If Lucidron could love life in Buchenwald, we can love life here even in a pandemic. <laughs> the final words of Lucerne's book read, why has this Frenchman from France written his book in the United States to present to his American friends? Because today he is America's guest. Loving the country and wanting to show his gratitude, he could find no better way of expressing it than in two truths. The first is that joy does not come from outside, for whatever happens to us, it is within. The second truth is that light does not come to us from without. Light is in us, even if we have no eyes. May we keep our inner light shining brightly now and always. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we come before you this morning to thank you for our lives, for another day to live and to learn, another day to love you and one another. We pray we would always live close to your spirit, listening for your word. We pray this morning for this church and for all houses of worship we ask you to bless all who come together to worship you and follow in your way. This time of a worldwide pandemic is difficult. We cannot gather safely in our traditional ways. So guide us in this time to keep our faith in you and remain strong as your people. We believe in caring for one another and we know that where there is caring and love, your spirit is there too. And with your spirit, all things are possible. We pray for all those among us who are ill. We ask that you would be close to them, guide the hands of the doctors and nurses caring for them. Though our bodies are all weak, our spirits can be strong in our faith. We pray for Donna, for Dolores and Terry, and their daughter. We pray for Martha, for Jim, for Becky, for Ray, for Grace, for Diana, for Esther, for Jeffrey, for Al Twanger and for Ann Schaub. We pray for those who are grieving. We ask that you would reach out with your comforting hand and help people know they are never alone in their grief. Give them hope and vis vision for a future. We know that the weeping may endure for the night Joy will come in the morning. We pray especially for the family of Bob Rizash. We pray also for the leaders of our nation and for the leaders of all nations. May they govern wisely and seek the good of all people living on this beautiful earth. Guide us to protect and preserve our planet and appreciate the gifts we are given. Sunshine to warm us, water to drink, food to eat, and the presence of all the plants and animals in your vast creation. We pray for peace in all the places where there is violence and conflict. We pray for the migrants fleeing their homes to find safe places to live. We pray, pray for Lebanon and for all the nations in turmoil. We pray all people will seek your spirit of peace and find ways to reconcile their differences fairly with diplomacy instead of war. And we pray for all those faithful people who continue to work for peace and for justice, so many of them right here in this church. We pray this Christian community will remain strong, following in your way, loving you and one another. And we will take a minute for silent prayer because we trust God that you listen even to our hearts.
And we pray now together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For those of you worshiping in the sanctuary, offering plates are available at both entrances to the sanctuary and on the table in front. For those joining us virtually, you are also invited to be part of the ministry and mission of this church by giving online. Simply go to the church website at pleasanthilluctn.org where there is a tab for giving. A reading from St. Francis of Assisi, The Sacraments. I once spoke to my friend, an old squirrel, about the sacraments. He got so excited and ran into a hollow in his tree and came back holding some acorns, an owl feather, and a ribbon he had found. And I just smiled and said, yes, dear, you understand. Everything imparts his grace. We have been blessed with God's abundance. Let us give back to God what is God's. Many of you may know the song this spiritual uh, called Follow the Drinking Gourd. Um, I went online and I did some research on, on the song and uh, the, the coded meanings in it. Um, if you know it, sing along on the chorus and um, in, uh, in the verses, at the end of each line is the Follow the Drinking Gourd, you can do that too. So anyway, um, feel free to join in. The sun comes up and the first quail calls. Follow the drinking cord, for the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom. If you follow. show you the way left foot peg foot traveling on follow the dream Another 
side, follow the drink and go. God, most merciful and gracious, of whose bounty we have all received, accept, we pray, this offering of your people. Remember and love those who have brought it and for those for whom it is given. Follow it with your blessing that it may promote peace and goodwill among all beings. Amen.
world, go in peace. Live as free people, love your life, pray for the sick, remember the poor, and take the grace of this hour with you. Amen. Amen.